again, thank you everybody for coming. We had no idea we'd see so many people out here tonight. Tonight we are fortunate to have um, Dr. Daniel Ryland and Dr. Faye Dixon here tonight to talk about um, understanding, understanding schizophrenia and ADHD. Um, they both have backgrounds from um, PhDs in clinical psychology from American University. And I'm sure they'll tell me a little bit about themselves too. Um, but um, Dr. Ryland is an associate professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at UC Davis, um, the Imaging Research Center. And then Dr. Dixon is um, a clinical psychologist at the UC Davis Mind Institute. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you all for turning out. This is a much better attendance than I ever get in Sacramento, so <laughs> doing well. And I'm going to figure out this remote system. And what I'm going to do, very briefly, we've been encouraged to give brief presentations, so there's a lot of time for questions. And um, I'll be talking um, about <coughs> schizophrenia, and then my, my colleague and partner, <laughs> hey, we'll talk about ADHD. And so what we'd ask you to do is to save your questions until both talks are given, and then we'll open up the floor for any questions or comments. And I really do want questions and comments because I'm just going to very briefly touch on a little bit of the neuroscience, touch on a little bit of um, this new work in terms of early identification and intervention, and then really just hopefully pique your interest so that there'll be lots of questions that we can answer. So we're going to begin by talking about just a brief definition. I know um, there's people from NAMI here, so there's many people in the audience who probably understand this illness very well. I'll provide a brief definition and then focus on what my research has been on is how it affects cognition and why that's important. Show how we're imaging the brain um, to understand where things are going wrong. And then end by talking about this new early intervention program. I'm still figuring out this remote. All right, here we go. Okay, so schizophrenia is defined by its symptoms. Um, and it's identified now as a brain disorder. It's not because you have bad parenting. There's no such thing as a schizophrenogenic mother. Um, it's a brain disorder that it affects people's ability to perceive understand and interpret the environment. It occurs about one out of 100 people worldwide. And there's a genetic component. So if, it's, if, uh, if one of your children has the illness, there's a 10% chance the sibling will have the illness. And the most strongly genetic it is, is only a 50% concordance rate for identical twins. So if you have two twins um, that share exactly 100% of their genes, if one is affected, there's only a 50-50 chance that the other will be affected. So clearly, it's genetic, but it's also environmental. And fortunately, the field has moved a little bit beyond nature versus nurture and understanding nature and nurture. Um, this illness affects function, both socially and motivationally. One of the real difficulties is that as a result of the, of the symptoms, people begin to withdraw from their social environment and they just lose motivation to function in the world. It's classically defined with um, behavioral symptoms, both positive and negative symptoms. The positive symptoms are the ones that get the most press and are most impressive. There are things like having um, auditory or visual hallucinations, seeing things or hearing things that aren't there. Um, but also there are negative symptoms where individuals um, have lack of social interest, um, often look like somebody who has depression, um, lack of enjoyment in life, and these negative symptoms are less responsive to treatment and are, uh, are kind of a pervasive problem in the illness even once you treat the hallucinations and delusions. The other thing I should have up here which I'll talk about are the cognitive symptoms which also tend to be enduring and not respond well to treatment. Women have a little bit better course of this illness. Um, the onset's a little bit later, and their outcome is a little bit better. And when you talk about pretty much any brain disorder, women look a little bit better than men do. 
Um, genetically, you can see from this concordance rate that it's quite complex. It's not something like um, a simple recessive gene where there's no single gene that explains this illness. It's analogous to something like heart disease where you have a family history of heart disease and um, it means that some people will have a very strong history. No matter what they do, they're going to have a heart attack. Some people have a history and if they exercise and um, eat a good diet and maintain their weight, they're never going to have a heart attack. So there's this genetic um, complexity and environmental complexity. And some of the most interesting research going on now in molecular research is talking about gene environment interactions. And neither one is determinate. They very much interact. So the effect on cognition is what my research has been on. And this is based on just a simple paper and pencil neuropsychological battery where you have a bunch of paper and pencil tests divided into different functions. So this might be abstraction, attention, verbal, facial, and spatial memory, language, spatial ability, and sensory motor ability. And healthy subjects are here on the zero line. This is um, unimpaired performance. And then we go down to about three standard deviations below the mean, where you can see if it's a person who has the illness, um, or a family member that's unaffected who does not have a diagnosis, if you're on this spectrum, um, there's impairment across these cognitive functions. Sometimes the impairment is only mild, and within a standard deviation, you wouldn't really call it an impairment. But there are certain areas that are more impaired than others, and the area of memory functioning is the area of greatest impairment in many studies um, of cognition. So it seems like there's a generalized dysfunction in cognition, and there's a more specific dysfunction in memory. Also, sometimes people see it in attention and um, frontal lobe function. The memory problem in schizophrenia is very interesting because it's very different from the way we normally think of memory, memory impairment. I think most typically people think of Alzheimer's dementia where you have somebody who might have some trouble learning information, but they learn what they learn they then forget. So you can ask them, you know, 15 minutes later and they have no recall of what they remember. This is the same kind of amnesia that you would have with somebody who has um, damage to their middle temporal lobe from a severe car accident or a stroke where the information just can't be consolidated and stored. The information is lost. And in schizophrenia, it's not really an issue of losing the information. It's an issue of not learning it efficiently. Because it's not organized and learned efficiently, it's difficult to retrieve. But what individuals do learn, they remember. So this is an example of a list learning task called the CVLT where healthy subjects are blue and affected individuals are in yellow. And you can see that across measures, patients are worse than controls. Um, but the interesting thing about that task is the words are organ can be organized into different categories. So there's items that are spices, there are items that are fruits, there's items that are clothing items. And so as you do the task, if you start to group together similar items, it helps you organize your learning and improves retrieval. And that's the semantic organization strategy that healthy subjects do very well, but patients don't. Um, in, con in contrast, you can just learn the list in order, and you tend to remember words at the beginning of the list and the end of the list, and you just use this kind of passive rehearsal strategy, which <coughs> patients do fine, but that's a must much less efficient strategy. <laughs> so they're not learning the information in an organized way that facilitates retrieval, but they're not forgetting which is illustrated in this graph where you have the patients in red and the controls in yellow um, matched on immediate recall of either stories or designs. And the amount of forgetting over a delay is the same between the two groups. And as I think you'll see, um, this characteristic of the memory impairment is much more hopeful than the characteristic of memory impairment that you would have in Alzheimer's dementia where you have lost the information. 